90.9 WBUR. This is a special live edition of Radio Boston at WBUR City Space. I'm Steve Brown. Daryl C. Murphy, WBUR's Consider This host. And I'm Sharman Takedi, political reporter for WCVB. Today we are broadcasting live from WBUR City Space for a special hour-long debate between the two Republican candidates for Lieutenant Governor. Today's debate is hosted by WBUR, the Boston Globe, and WCVB. We'll get started in just a moment with candidates' opening statements, but first, let's go over the basic rules so everyone knows exactly how this will go. Candidates will have one minute to respond to each question, followed by a one-minute rebuttal. We, the moderators, will be able to ask follow-up questions of both candidates' responses at our discretion. Those follow-up responses will be 30 seconds. You'll see the timer right in front of the stage, the green light. Uh, will turn yellow when you have 15 seconds remaining and then red when you are out of time. And listeners, there are several ways you can follow along today. Aside from listening on WBUR, we're also broadcasting a live video feed of today's event. Go to WBUR.org, BostonGlobe.com, or WCVB.com to watch. So let's begin with opening statements from both candidates. The order was decided by random draw. We'll hear first from Leah Cole Allen. Leah Cole Allen is a former state representative who served the 12th Essex District. She is declared as the running mate of Jeff Deal. Cole Allen was first elected in 2013 at the age of 24. She left office two years later in 2015 to pursue a nursing career. Until recently, she worked as a registered nurse at Beverly Hospital. Leah Cole Allen. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's so nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, You did a great job introducing me. Took a bunch of what I was going to say. Um, But... I am a lifelong resident of Massachusetts, born and raised in Lynn, proud graduate of Lynn Public Schools, vocational school graduate. I am a wife. Uh, My husband is a union elevator mechanic out of Local 4 Boston. I'm a mother of two small kids, and I'm a registered nurse. I worked uh, at a local hospital throughout the pandemic. I ended up losing my job over the vaccine mandates, and I am in this race because The pandemic really highlighted for me the need for critical thinking in our executive leadership when it comes to making decisions and the fact that um, no emergency should ever suspend our constitutional rights as citizens. And I think part of what we need to identify when fixing the problems facing our state is that we have caused a lot of them. Uh, When I saw that Jeff Deal was running, I was very excited to jump on board. We are the uh, team that will protect your wallet, uh, protect your freedoms, and protect your children. Next up, I'd like to introduce Kate Campanelli. Kate Campanelli is former state representative who served the 17th Worcester District. She is declared as the running mate to Republican gubernatorial candidate Chris Doty. She was first elected in 2015 and held the post for four years. She left Beacon Hill in 2019 to pursue a job in teaching. She most recently worked as a deputy director of communications for the Executive Office of Labor and Workplace Development in the Baker administration. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to WBUR, the Boston Globe, and WCBV for hosting today's debate. I'm Kate Campanelli, and I'm running to be your next lieutenant governor because our Commonwealth is at a crossroads, and the decision we make on September 6th will have wide-ranging consequences for Massachusetts. In choosing our next governor and lieutenant governor, we have to look at who has the appropriate experience, vision, and plans to lead. I joined Chris Doty because I believe together we are that team. Chris brings an executive level perspective that puts him in a unique position to solve the complex issues that we face. I bring my legislative experience and that makes us the only balanced ticket with the broad experience needed for Massachusetts. It would be detrimental to allow our state to resort to one party rule, that to be effective, Beacon Hill needs a necessary friction that comes with a healthy exchange of ideas from both sides of the aisle. I look forward to today's debate and discussing our plans for the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, Nice to meet you both. Let's head into our first topic, the job and making an impact with it. According to the Secretary of the Commonwealth's website, the Lieutenant Governor has two major responsibilities. One, in the absence, resignation, death, or disability of the Governor, the Lieutenant Governor performs all their duties and has all their constitutional powers. And two, is a voting member of the Governor's Council, which advises on judicial nominations, pardons, and commutations. The LG has also delegated certain responsibilities at the Governor's discretion. 
So this first question is to both of you. We'll start with Kate. Uh, officially on paper, Massachusetts lieutenant governors have little power. Historically, their impact has come in large part from the roles and responsibilities that they've led once in office. Given this, in concert with the governor, what will be your job once elected and what skill set of proven experience will enable you to be successful in that job? You have one minute. Sure. Other than the statutory uh, requirements that you just mentioned, uh, Chris and I see this job as a partnership in the administration. Chris brings his executive experience. I bring my legislative experience to really make a balanced team. We'll be successful at that. It, we also see the successful leadership that the LG's office has had currently at being that, that point person to our municipalities across the Commonwealth, and we plan to continue that in our administration. Also, something that we've learned throughout our campaign is that tourism here in Massachusetts has gone from the top five and dropped to 21st in the country. So we see that as a vital role as, as Lieutenant Governor, and my office would take responsibility of restoring that industry here in Massachusetts. And we look forward to leading, and we look forward to bringing a great quality of life to the people of Massachusetts. Okay. Leah, one minute. So absolutely, as um, chair of the Governor's Council, it would be extremely important that we bring uh, a set of eyes that will counteract. Uh, right now, our Governor's Council has a totally Democratic makeup. They're all Democrats, and we need um, the balance there to make sure that we're vetting our possible judges and our parole board members. I think that we need to make sure that uh, the judges have a good understanding of our Constitution and an interpretation of how they would um, administer the law under that, as well as uh, we need to make sure that they are enforcing our laws. We have a lot of, for instance, firearms laws on the books. The fact is that they're not properly being prosecuted. So one of the most important jobs of the lieutenant governor would be to make sure that our governor's council um, is, is appointing judges that share the, um, the values of the people of Massachusetts. And the second thing is parents uh, in education. I would be a liaison to parents and make sure that they're being heard when it comes to what their children are learning in school, what they want to see happen, um, what their tax dollars are paying for. And all those are very important. And, and just a quick follow, Leah Cole Allen. What skill set do you think you bring to the table to chair the governor's council and, and help make some of those decisions about judges? I have the legislative experience. I, I was a former state representative. I'm also a mother. Um, I bring the a point of view of young families in Massachusetts and what's facing them as far as what we're facing for high inflation, what's going on in our schools, so a lot of the mandates that are going, that are going on. Um, and I think that I also bring the perspective of someone who has spent a lot of time working in the private sector. I have a medical background. I think that, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic, that's an important skill set to have, and I, I look forward to bringing those skills to Massachusetts. All right, that's time. And, and Kate, I did want to ask you a little bit about, you talked about a partnership, a balanced team. So what exactly do you think the current lieutenant governor uh, is is expressing in terms of leadership with municipalities. You talked about that. What what exactly is she doing? Sure, I think one of the the I, I've talked about this on the campaign trail. One of the the best things that the the current administration did when they came into office was the community compact agreement with all 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. They went to each municipality to find out what best worked for their community, and keeping that relationship is vital to for the state government and and our cities and towns across Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, question to, uh, to both of you, we'll start with Leah. Uh, what's one policy or initiative led by the current Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito, that you would like to continue? I think that she's done great work on um, domestic abuse survivors and standing up for them. And it's unfortunate that the legislature didn't end up um, moving forward with a lot of the initiatives that the Baker Polito team tried to put forward to protect victims of domestic assault. I think that as a woman, as a mother, that's something very important to me as well. And of course, being a liaison to our municipalities, that's very important, making sure that they're getting what they need to hold the line on taxes, make sure that our property taxes don't need to keep going up, that seniors and young families can afford to stay in Massachusetts. Massachusetts and, and thrive here. Okay. Kate? Sure. It, you know, I mentioned uh, the relationship between uh, municipalities, but also I think if, if we're not here to, to rate uh, the Baker Polito administration, but if we were, let's go back to the Patrick administration and to see the Patrick administration, their businesses, they considered their number one um, was a public enemy number one, and they actually lowered. Uh, local aid to our cities and towns. When the Baker administration came in, they hold, 
held the line on, on taxes. They made sure that our cities and towns were properly funded. Now, Chris and I don't always agree with Charlie Baker and Karen Polito, but what we do know is that they made a much better team than Martha Coakley ever would. Okay. Uh, Kate, as uh, Lieutenant Governor, you'll be uh, supporting uh, Rolf to the governor uh, and often expected to be, at least publicly, completely on board with the governor's policies and initiatives. But you may also have your own opinions and positions that, that might differ. Uh, what happens when you have a different viewpoint than your boss? Can you describe a time when this has happened and, and how you handled it? Sure. Well, I, I'm very happy to, this morning to have the support of of a governor candidate, Chris Doty, here with me. I think it shows the support and respect that we have for each other and for our team. And with that, it, it be, we've been working together for, for months now, and we come together as that strong team, that balanced ticket, as I had talked about. But one thing that that we respect about each other is a difference of opinion and we work through that and we already have and it, you know that's what makes us such a great team a strong team because we can come together on those ideas and differences although as skew as they are <laughs> um that's what that that's why um we chris Doty and i are 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 a great team together okay leah you have a, a minute so Jeff Deal and I worked together in the legislature. We worked on a number of initiatives trying to bring more transparency and accountability to the State House. We were uh, the champions of repealing the automatic gas tax in 2014 that would have been tied to inflation. And that was at a time when inflation was nowhere near what it is today. So that was the kind of foresight that we had then to look at the long-term unintended consequences of a lot of policies. So when Jeff Deal was running, I originally thought I would just come out and support him because having worked with him, I thought he would make a great governor. He has really common sense, good ideas for Massachusetts. He's been traveling all over the state listening to the voters, and I wanted to come out and support him. And when the conversation changed for me to get back into this race, uh, that we already agreed on a lot of things. If there was a difference of opinion, uh, we certainly would work that out. We've already had a few, and it's just part of part of um, our democracy. It would happen with Democrats, it will happen under our own governorship, and it's just something you have to work together. And just a quick follow, and you have 30 seconds for the follow, even though there may be moments where you disagree with um, the, the gubernatorial candidate, do you ever envision yourself defending a position that perhaps you don't, you're not 100% in favor of? Go ahead, Leah. No, I think it's important to have that diversity of thought. And if there is something, for instance, that I don't agree with as um, a constitutional power that the governor has, I would, I would come out against that. I don't see Jeff Deal ever doing that because he's a strong believer in our constitutional rights. But it's those types of things that you can't, um, you can't waver on your integrity when you get into office. Okay. Sure, Chris and I are a balanced ticket. We come, we come together with, with different experiences and, and different outlooks, and that's what makes us strong. So we lean on each other for our differences of opinion. We know where we're strong, we know where we're weak, and that's what, what brings us together to make the right decision. Okay. Uh, this question, I'll start with uh, Leah. The Massachusetts Constitution has the unique feature of transferring gubernatorial authority when the governor leaves the state. While Massachusetts has rarely had a lieutenant governor go rogue, it is not without precedent. Is there an issue that you're so passionate about that you would use your temporary gubernatorial authority in this situation to exercise power? If so, how and when? I think one of the biggest issues facing us right now is really we need people in office who have a commitment to medical freedom. I think what we saw throughout the pandemic with these mandates and some cities were instituting vaccine passports, that's a form of segregation, that's a form of um, government overreach. If there was any kind of policy that, for instance, would bring back the, um, the program that the state spent half a million dollars implementing for the vaccine passports, that would be something that I would immediately take issue with because I think going forward, that's going to be a huge privacy issue, it's going to be a huge constitutional rights issue, and it's going to be just really probably one of the biggest issues of our times if we keep um, basing people's freedom on their medical decisions. Okay. Sure. Chris and I certainly don't have an adversarial relationship, so I don't see uh, that being a problem if you were to ever to leave the state. I, we come to, to this ticket on the same page of our issues to make Massachusetts more affordable for better schools and to make sure that our, our funding for our cities and towns is there. And I, we, we're on the same page, and I don't see that adversarial relationship. Okay. So you wouldn't go rogue? No, no, no okay. go rogue. <laughs> um, 
the, is, if elected, uh, you will chair the governor's council, uh, which is uh, composed of eight elected members, uh, excluding you, uh, who serve two-year terms. Uh, first question, and this is just a quick one, uh, one sentence is fine. Have you ever been to a governor's council meeting? Okay. I, I've watched them, uh, yes, okay. live streamed, okay. uh, watched several of them. Lee? Yes, I did attend part of one when I was a state legislator. Okay. Uh, of the eight members uh, of the council, six are up for re-election this year and, and two are not running again for their seats. This means there could be room for potential change on the council. Right now, uh, all the members are white and evenly split between men and women. My question is, do you agree that it's time for a change on the council? And if so, what would you want to uh, change that change to look like? We'll have 30 seconds. Uh, Lee. Lee. So I think that uh, part of the, the problem is that a lot of people don't even realize that there is a governor's council, what their role is. And um, as lieutenant governor, that's something that I could bring uh, to light with my platform and get people involved. I think um, the Massachusetts Republican Party has put forth the most diverse slate of candidates that we've seen ever in the party. And I would like to see that translate into uh, the governor's council because people can bring their different cultural backgrounds, but also their commitment to upholding the values that make our country great. Sure. Kate? Sure. Uh, this is, this, uh, we all have our roles and those for running for governor's council have theirs to, uh, to go to the, the public and make their case for why people should elect them. So it's their job to, to get elected for their job to say why they're diverse. Um, that's not really the governor's, uh, a lieutenant governor's job mm -hmm. to get in, involved in their, in their races. Okay. Uh, right now, uh, Governor Charlie Baker has not endorsed a candidate for governor. Uh, Kate, uh, you, you said in the to the Boston Globe, this election isn't about Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It's uh, it, not. It isn't even about Charlie Baker. It's about looking forward. Uh, do you think you can win without Charlie Baker's endorsement? Absolutely. I look at the the momentum that uh, Chris and I's team have have had since we got into this race, and our message is resonating with all of those across the Commonwealth, from the right to the left to everyone in the middle. We're talking to those people who are exhausted with party politics, and our message of affordability, of good schools for our kids, of making sure our communities are funded, is resonating. So yes, we can win. Okay, uh, Leah, with, uh, when it comes to endorsements, Jeff Deal has a few. He's been backed by former President Trump and by the Republican Party at May's uh, Mass GOP convention. Uh, Leah, uh, do you consider an endorsement by the former president to be a positive or negative accolade in this race? I think that the policies that we had under the former president are what we are running on. We had energy independence. We had uh, border security. We had... Um, on low unemployment rates. I think that um, people's retirement funds were doing better. Those are the things that we're running on are those policies. And I think if anyone is honest with themselves that we were better off um, f three or four years ago than we are today. So, so just to follow up, you believe having the former president's endorsement would be a positive? Well, it hasn't hurt us so far. People are very upset with uh, President Joe Biden. They, he has a, a, even a low approval rating here in Massachusetts. I think that uh, in Massachusetts, we're looking at it through a different lens than we had pre-pandemic. Um, Post-pandemic, I think that people are uh, tired of the government getting involved in their personal decisions. They wanna see some leadership that's going to hold the line on our values. They wanna make sure that their tax dollars are being spent wisely, that they're, it's affordable for themselves and their families to live. And leadership has consequences right. and we need to- That's time. Thank you. All right, and Kate. Sure, I, you know, I think a Donald Trump endorsement is guaranteeing a lose in November here in Massachusetts. We're not focused on national politics. Chris and I are here to focus on Massachusetts issues. Both of our opponents on the, the right and the left are so focused on this one man. One wants to be like them, the other wants to, to sue them uh, and happy to do that over a hundred times. Do I have a time for rebuttal? Just 10 seconds. Okay, uh, I'd just like to say that although your running mate voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, he has admitted that he voted for Donald Trump in 2020. So I would assume that that means that he saw that his policies were better for his business, better for his family, and became a de facto Trump supporter by voting for him in 2020. Well, if we bring up the Hillary Clinton vote, I think we have to look at, at uh, my, running, my running mates. Um, 
uh, my opponent's running mate, mate's record in, in the Boston Globe had had come out with an article saying that he voted for Joe Biden back in 2008. But we really have to look at that because in 2008 in the Massachusetts primary, okay. Joe Biden, okay. Okay. this is right. very important. Well, okay. Joe, Biden had, Joe Biden had Joe Biden had had not been in the Make election. So who did who did Jeff Deal vote for in that election? Was it okay. Hillary Clinton or was it Barack Obama? And why did he lie? OK. Daryl? You're listening to a special edition of Radio Boston live from WBUR City Space. This is a debate between two Republican candidates for Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor. The debate is sponsored by WBUR and our partners at the Boston Globe and WCVB. We have with us former state representatives Kate Campanelli and Leah Cole Allen. We are broadcasting live on 90.9 WBUR and streaming live video on WBUR.org, BostonGlobe.com, and WCVB.com. Right now, we're going to head to a lightning round, just to kind of lighten the mood a little bit. Uh, and I want to start with you, uh, Miss uh, Leah, Allen, Leah Cole Allen, excuse me. Um, who is on your Massachusetts Mount Rushmore? Massachusetts Mount Rushmore. You know, I, that's a good question. I have never thought about this, so it's gonna, it might take me a minute. Okay. I don't this is a lightning idolize, round, though. <laughs> we don't have a minute. Yeah, I don't tend to idolize um, public servants or people in office, so that's definitely a difficult one for me. That's okay. fair. Uh, I'll go to a sports one. Uh, Bob Cousy, um, uh, Tom Brady. Um, we'll also put Bobby Orr on there as well, and, and Big Poppy. We'll round it out. Okay. Uh, Last book you read that you really enjoyed? Oh, I'm currently slowly reading a book that my sister-in-law gave me by Elan Hildebrand, uh, Winter in Paradise. Yeah. I don't have a lot of time for reading for myself, but uh, I just recently read a great children's book, my daughter's favorite, which is Giraffes Can't Dance. So. Okay. Uh, what's on your long drive playlist? Me first? Okay, uh, definitely, I tend to prefer to listen to podcasts and things like that. I like to listen to um, just all kinds of different viewpoints on things. I'm very interested in, obviously, um, health issues, so I like to listen to things about nutrition or like local organic farming, um, sustainability in that way, stuff like that. Understood, Kate. Okay. If I were to listen to the, the radio to clear my mind, it would probably be Kenny Chesney's No Shoes Radio. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, and uh, the last question. Do you ride the MBTA? If so, what's the route? Uh, you know, we, uh, my, my running mate and I rode the MBTA a few weeks ago, and I rode from, from Riverside uh, down to, to Park Street and uh, enjoyed that trip. Understood. Leah? I haven't in a while. I used to, I had an internship when I was a senior because I went to a technical high, a vocational high school, so I had my co-op week. I used to ride from uh, Wonderland to um, Government Center on the, I think it was the Green Line, and then I had my internship downtown Boston. Okay. And so, uh, speaking of transportation, moving on, um, we are, I'm going to ask you about the T. Uh, beginning now with the MBTA, next week the entire Orange Line and the newly constructed Green Line extension will close for roughly a month. Both are unprecedented shutdowns. This follows repeated safety incidents across the entire MBTA system, including a fire on an Orange Line train last month and a bus fire that sent two MBTA employees to the hospital earlier this month. Uh, how would you grade the T's performance and why? Uh, Leah, excuse me. <laughs> uh, right now, I think that the T gets at least a D or D minus because I understand that there have been some efforts put forth to make sure that we're prioritizing safety and maintenance, but definitely those have to be at the forefront. They also get a poor grade for transparency. I mean, our tax dollars are used to fund the, pun the pensions at the T, and that's been a huge um, 
boondoggle for quite some time. Actually, WBUR wrote a great article about the secrecy of that fund and um, why they're not moving it into more of the state workers fund where the fees are lower, we can get a better return on investment. And um, at some point, you know, uh, right now we're taking in more, um, we're paying out more in pensions than, than we're taking in, which is never a sustainable practice. And at some point we need to definitely address that because we could probably be making more investments if we weren't paying so much into the pension fund. We just need better management of it. Understood. Okay. Okay. Uh, Chris and I do not support the shutdown of the T, the orange line, or the, the suspension, two-week suspension of the green line. You know, we see this as a, as a crisis, and we would treat this as any kind of emergency crisis uh, that uh, a state would have, like a snow emergency. And we would ask that other states bring in their experts and workers to help fix the T during overnight hours, off hours, so we can keep those safeties in check. We can help make the teeth safer during those overnight hours without making any disruptions to riders who depend on the tea for their livelihood. You know, Chris and I are the only ones with a plan here uh, for the MBTA, which addresses safety, which addresses uh, the financial plan, which also addresses uh, employee engagement. And that plan, although it's, it's very long to talk about, can be found at chrisforma.com. I, ju I just have a quick follow, if that's all right. Um, you know, speaking of snow emergencies, the governor took ownership of this system in 2015. There are a lot of folks on Beacon Hill who say he is to blame for the T's failures. 30 seconds, is he? Sure. And it, this has been decades long problem. Governor Baker took the responsibility that most governors wouldn't have taken. He put in that fiscal control board and he did the best that he could. I think what's coming to light is that you have more and more problems and people are paying attention to that right now. There's a lot of work still to be done, but Charlie Baker did uh, make improvements. Leah Cole Allen, is he to blame? 30 seconds. No, I think the, the 2015 uh, snowstorms are unprecedented and he had just taken office. There wasn't a whole lot that he could have done to prevent that. Um, and I do agree that this has been decades in the making. There's been a disconnect somewhere between management and maintenance and safety protocols. And definitely that's, that's an important issue that we need to focus on in the uh, governor's office. In the spring, uh, the Federal Transit Administration assumed a safety oversight role of the MBTA following the death of a man who got his arm caught in between a pair of red line train doors. Uh, now, some, including Rep. William Strauss, House Chairman of the State's Joint Committee on Transportation, have called for a federal takeover of the MBTA. The question is, how much control should the federal government have in running the T? Kate, 60 seconds. Sure, I don't think we need federal control, but what we need to do, these problems we're found can be primarily fixed in the rail yard versus the boardroom. You know, the experience that Chris and I bring, especially Chris and from his business working in a manufacturing company, this is what he lives for. He lives for safety checks, priorities. And what was uh, an, an anecdote when we, released our plan just a few weeks ago on the MBTA, the next day the federal government put out a plan that looked exactly like Chris's. So I think we're, we're in line. We know what the T needs. It needs the management. It needs the, the financial stability. But employee engagement is huge as well. And when we talk to T employees, they tell us that board members, that management have not been down to the railroad. They haven't been there, the rail yard. They haven't been there to talk to them, to, to engage them. And morale is really lacking. And, and that's a problem. Yeah. I don't think that the uh, federal takeover is the right uh, decision to fixing the T. I think that we need to look at the management. We need to examine the Carmen's Union as well. We need to look at uh, kind of some of these management positions, whether or not they were given through patronage or whether or not it was true actual uh, transportation experience. And we definitely need to bring people on board who have that experience, who have managed large um, projects like that and just kind of look at it from many angles. It, it, the, the problems at the T don't operate in a vacuum, so we'll have to uh, come at it from many different angles. So just to follow up in, in 30 seconds to each of you, do you think the federal government should leave and leave the state to try to fix the problems on its own, Leah? Generally Ooh. speaking, oh. Apologies, no. Leah Cole, go ahead. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, I think that the more you bring in the federal government, the more you get um, centralized planning, less control at the local level, less ability to make changes when necessary. And also a lot of federal money comes with strings attached that might not always be the best um, for, for the state. 
All right, and go ahead. Okay, at, at this point in time, I, I think the federal government being involved is okay. I think they're they're showing that management that is lacking. They're giving a priority list again those safety check measures that need to be done from the T. Uh, on the T. So I think it's something that we can uh, embrace but phase out of as we get the T stabilized. All right. Now, fewer people on the T means potentially more on the roads. Dan McNichol, transportation advocate and former spokesperson for the Big Dig, told WBUR earlier this month that the roads in Massachusetts are not ready to handle that influx. He called it Carmageddon. I believe we saw something similar in 2015. What would be the proactive approach right now to make sure roads and bridges and other infrastructure prepared for potentially more cars on the road? Go ahead, Kate. Sure. You know, uh, when, when we talk about infrastructure, you know, we have to think that there's over $670,000 per mile per year that we're paying here in Massachusetts for our roads. That's eight times the national average on administration and four times the national average for maintenance. You know, when we talk to our municipalities, their biggest concern is their small bridges and the small bridge projects that are that are funded through MassDOT and the current administration. So we want to make sure that we ease that transition and make sure that these projects continue. Also, Chris and his business, every year he's looked for a 3% reduction. And these are these are things that we can look at as an administration. How can we reduce the DOT administration costs by 3% every year to make sure that we're funding our priorities, our cities and towns are getting their Chapter 90 funding, but uh, alleviating some of that, that bloated uh, taxpayer uh, burden. Leah? Yeah, we spend more per mile uh, on our roads than any other state in New England, and that's an issue. Uh, the, the thing is that Massachusetts, we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem and the way we spend our money, the priorities. A lot of time, money is allocated for these projects and never released. So it's time that we um, start releasing the funds that are allocated for our roads and bridges, make the necessary changes. Uh, we can do this at a time overnight work. I think we just need to make sure that we prioritize that so that we're not clogging up um, the streets during uh, commuting hours. And also, you know, we, we should, we have work from home now. The pandemic did bring us that. I think we should um, encourage companies to let their, their workers stay home, keep them off the roads, um, or at least, you know, um, during rush hour times. So there's, we have to think creatively. And uh, marijuana is legal in Massachusetts, as is sports betting. According to the Cannabis Control Commission, between November 2018 and November 2019, the cannabis industry brought in roughly 39, oh, $397 million in gross sales. Originally, according to reporting from Boston.com, the state's Department of Revenue estimated the state would collect anywhere from $44 million to $82 million in the fiscal year of 2019. There's predictions that sports betting could generate roughly $60 million in tax revenue yearly and another $70 to $80 million in license fees. What should the state be doing with this income and should some of it be going to these infrastructure projects? Kate. You know, I think what you just read is a great example of why we don't need the so-called fair share amendment or progressive graduated tax amendment, which is on the ballot this November. Right there, we have some new income revenue coming that can be used. Uh, and what we've seen typically in the legislature is this money is used for the general fund to be spent how the legislature sees fit. But one thing that Chris and I will do uh, before we're even sworn in is work on the budget and those priorities. So I think it's, it's all about prioritization. It's about looking at the budget, looking where this money can be put towards the greatest need. Leah? Yeah, I think that's a great example of, of new income streams that will make it easier for us to cut taxes for people. Right now, while everyone's uh, struggling with high inflation, high gas prices, property taxes, I think, uh, you know, that definitely we need to use those funds and make sure that we are, we are prioritizing where they're going, that they're fixing our roads and bridges, and that we're not spending it on a lot of people talking about what we're going to do. We actually have to put that money to, to work. And Jeff Deal as governor will do that because um, he has proven and has a proven track record in the legislature of working for the people to get things done. All right, there's a lot more we could talk about here, but we only have you both for an hour. So we have a couple more topics we want to dig into. Next up, the 
economy. The state legislature recessed for August, as you know, with a major bill still in committee, the $4.5 billion economic development bill. Now, Senate President Karen Spilka says the legislature still has work to do, wants the legislature to return from recess and get that done. House Speaker Ron Mariano says no, people have vacations, they should take time off. My question is, and to you, Kate, first, and you have a minute, should Beacon Hill lawmakers return to work right now? Do they have an obligation to? Absolutely. They have an obligation to the taxpayers. As a former legislator, I know you have to do your job. You have to be there for the taxpayers. And yes, uh, according to 64F that we're waiting for the, the, audit, the auditor's report in September, we do have some time there, but the legislators do need to be accountable to the taxpayers and make sure that we're, we're getting that tax relief. We're talking about $3.5 billion in excess funding and at a time that we need it the most. And funding for hospitals as well as, as child care. Leah Cole Allen, do you think the legislature should go back in a session and get this done? I do. I think it was kind of a testament to how the legislature feels about the people of Massachusetts, that they think that their summer vacations are more important than providing uh, relief to senior citizens when it comes to housing, when it comes to um, providing relief to families, um, paying for child care. And hospitals, uh, I think that they say that they need that money. I think that they made quite a bit of money uh, over the pandemic. And if they had just not fired a lot of their nurses over the vaccine mandate, then maybe they wouldn't meet, need to spend so much money uh, paying exorbitant amounts for travel nurses. And that's something that they should be left holding the bag for and the taxpayers shouldn't have to bail them out for that. All right, well, in the meantime, we did talk a little bit about this. Massachusetts residents are without tax relief unless this law kicks in, which we expect it will, and tough times are out there for many people. For example, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, as of this past May, food prices in the Boston area had risen by nearly 9% from last year. This is the highest annual advance recorded in Boston since the beginning of 1981. What are your plans to help residents now who are struggling? Leah, you can go first. I think if we make Massachusetts more affordable as a whole, um, there's not much we can do uh, as a state government to lower food costs, but if we can try to encourage local uh, farming and make sure that we're feeding the people of our state, um, that's something that we that we should support and encourage. I think that if we cut taxes um, for the in state income tax, if we roll that back, um, that will give people more money in, in their family budgets to, to pay for food. I also think that if we cut the, the gas tax, um, a lot of this, you know, when prices go up on businesses and, uh, and trucking and things like that, th those prices get passed on to the consumer. They're not eating those prices. So things that might be done uh, like raising, we can lower the, the corporate taxes, um, LLCs, things like that. And hopefully that will um, help alleviate some of the burden on the people of Massachusetts. And Kate? Hey, Chris and I are the only team in this race with a, a plan to cut taxes for Massachusetts. Last week, we came out with a 10-point plan to cut taxes here in Massachusetts. That included taxes for businesses, also taxes for individuals. We need to make Massachusetts more business-friendly. We make it, need to make it more affordable to live, and we are the only team proposing real solutions for the taxpayers here in Massachusetts. And to that point of offering relief to some of the residents, do you support efforts to uh, make transportation fare free, public transportation fare free, Leah? I don't support making it free. I think that we can explore making it uh, reduced fares based on income, but I think everybody should have a stake in, in paying for um, the tea that they're using. It just makes for better government. Hey, no, we. I do not support uh, tax-free. Uh, I mean, uh, free free fares, uh, especially for the for the MBTA. At a time right now, we need to stabilize the MBTA and, um, and tax-free. I fare-free is is not not the option. The way to go. All right, we want to move on to according to Mass.gov, Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. She makes $165,000 a year. Now, census data from 2020 shows the median household income in Massachusetts is roughly $84,000. That's nearly $100,000 less than your potential salary if elected. Do you think having this salary puts you in touch with the average working family, Kate? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's up to the legislature, <laughs> and this is what the legislature did. I'm not in this for the salary. I quit my job 
to to run for Chris Doty because I believe in in our plan to make Massachusetts more affordable. And that's what we're focused on. Do you think that makes you, th that puts you in touch with the average working family making that kind of a salary? I, I don't think tying it to a salary is right. I mean, I'm here right now where my husband and I are struggling on one salary. If anything right now, it's putting me more in touch with the people of Massachusetts because I understand what they're going through as far as affordability, as far as the high prices right now. All right. So uh, the, I'm not running for a salary. I'm running to do the job in Massachusetts. Leah Cole Allen, you have one minute to answer. I think I come from a background that is already in touch with the people struggling, and that's why I'm running. I was happy working as a registered nurse. I was let go from my job because of government mandates. I saw a lot of what happened in Massachusetts with uh, the government overreaching on their heavy lockdowns and their, their mandates that affected a lot of people, closed small businesses. Uh, and I think that that's why I'm running. Um, I, and yeah, I think that in general, uh, Massachusetts probably pays their politicians too much. And that's why people keep wanting to run for office. Um, I think th that I think that it doesn't put me out of touch with voters. I'm running for the people, and what I'm hearing across the state everywhere is the things that we're talking about. People are concerned that their kids are going to be um, putting masks back on in schools, that they're going to be closing schools, that mandates are, are um, going to go back into effect. People are still losing their jobs. We're losing critical um, state workers, state troopers, DCF workers, and these are things that are all because of, of mandates, and that's what puts right, me in touch time. with people. That's time. Now, in 2017, both Governor Charles Charlie Baker and Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito declined to take a pay raise that was passed by the state legislature. Baker at the time called it fiscally irresponsible, as reported by The Globe. The following year, both reversed course, accepting the nearly 6% raise and housing allowances as well. Now, here in Boston, there's a proposal with the city council from Mayor Michelle Wu to increase the mayoral salary cap to $230,000 annually and bump the annual city councilor wage limit to $115,000. So my question is, in what circumstances would you accept or not accept a pay raise as Lieutenant Governor Leah? I think um, $165,000 is well more than probably the Lieutenant Governor's position uh, demands and any increase I, I would be comfortable not accepting. All right, and Kate? Sure. You know, uh, when we look at this and when we look at people running for office, we have to make sure that they have good intentions in mind. And it's hard to, to, to get good candidates to run without paying them a salary. It's hard to get good candidates to run by giving them too much. So it's finding that, that great middle spot uh, when we're talking about uh, city councilors, state reps, state representatives. But again, I'm not in this for the salary. I'm in this for the job. Okay, we have uh, we want to talk about the millionaires tax. We've discussed it just just a little bit. In November voters will face a ballot question to implement the so-called fair share amendment. If approved, it would amend the state constitution and put an extra four percent tax on any state resident's personal income over one million dollars. Now, uh, it appears as though, so. Given some of the benefits, we want to talk about some of the benefits. According to reporting from GBH, researchers from the Tufts University Center for State Policy Analysis found in January the measure could have the ability to generate $1.3 billion in 2023 and would likely advance racial and economic equity, but also change the behavior of top earners who are those being taxed. Given these benefits, make the case why we do not need this tax. 60 seconds, Kate. Sure. It, let's look at the examples of where this has happened. We can look at Connecticut, Maryland, where they've implemented a, a progressive um, graduated income tax. They were some of the top earners in these states, and they've all left. That's exactly what's happening in Massachusetts right now. We talk to residents who have moved to New Hampshire. They've moved to Florida. And that is what's going to happen if we implement this fair share uh, amendment here in Massachusetts. These are the job creators here in our state and we can't have them leaving. We can't create a worse environment for them to do business, for them to create jobs. All right, Leah? I think to call it a millionaire's tax is very misleading. First of all, a million dollars is not what it used to be. Um, and also this would affect um, retired 
families because this this tax would um, also affect you on one time income which means that if you sell your house and we all know that it's easy to to get a house valued at close to a million dollars on top of any income that you have you're going to be taxed at that at uh, nine percent and that could um, that you could lose your nest egg over that so that's it's very dangerous for um, our senior citizens and I think that uh, once you change once you amend the Constitution to have a graduated income tax right now it's income over a million dollars but who's to say that next it wouldn't be eighty thousand or seventy five thousand or whatever the legislature thinks is too much uh, money and that they want a piece of that. All right. Thank you. We are listening to a special edition of Radio Boston Live from WBUR City Space. This is a debate between the two Republican candidates for Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor. The debate is sponsored by WBUR and our partners at the Boston Globe and WCVB. We have with us former state representatives Kate Campanelli and Leah Cole Allen. We are broadcasting live on 90.9 WBUR and streaming live video on WBUR.org, bostonglobe.com, and WCVB.com. Now we want to move to uh, a topic that can become heated at times. In May, Beacon Hill lawmakers, they overrode a veto from Governor Charlie Baker on a bill that would grant undocumented residents the ability to get a driver's license. Now Massachusetts is one of 16 other states with similar laws. Following the override, members of the GOP began working to get the law as a ballot question for voters in November so they could repeal it. Are you in favor of repealing the bill and should voters have the ability to make that decision or not, Kate? Sure, I, Chris and I are in favor of this uh, ballot initiative. We certainly would veto the bill for the same reasons that Governor Baker did. The, the fact that implementing this through the RMB has many concerns and many problems. Now, our, my, my opponent had the opportunity to talk on the House floor to represent her constituents on this very issue in 2016 when it was debated on the House floor, but she wasn't there because she quit. She left her constituents without a voice and she was absent. Now she thinks collecting signatures absolves her from this, and it doesn't. Uh, all right, Leah Cole Allen, I want to give you a chance to respond. Yeah, so definitely, I think that uh, we need the voters to be able to weigh in on this. Um, across the state, this is one of the biggest issues that people are worried about because um, it will become, uh, make Massachusetts a magnet state for illegal immigration, which has far reaching consequences. It will put a strain on our already strained public schools, our healthcare system, our public services, uh, and the RMV is not equipped to deal with this type of um, document verification. We, we know that there's a lot of issues plaguing the RMV when it comes to administration and um, bookkeeping. Um, and also, this is just a band-aid on a much larger issue, which is that we have a broken immigration system. And actually, Jeff Deal, when he was in the legislature, he filed a bill that would um, bring some of the naturalization process back to Massachusetts to streamline it and to let people um, uh, become citizens quicker so that people who want a better life for their family can come to Massachusetts and do it the right way. But putting a Band-Aid on it by giving them driver's licenses is not the right solution. I just want to ask a follow-up because one of the arguments that was made um, from Democratic leadership is that undocumented drivers are still out there. They're still driving. So why not teach them the rules of the road? Why not get them licensed and, and paying into insurance, Leah? Because I think that, like I said, it's just a band-aid for an underlying problem. Uh, once we do this, it's going to, like I said, make Massachusetts a magnet state for illegal immigration. There is something that needs to be done about the people already here. I just don't think that driver's licenses are the way, uh, the way to, to fix the problem. I think it's just going to make things actually worse in the long run. Okay. Sure, driving is a privilege and this is rewarding bad behavior. The fact that the RMV cannot process uh, who's legal and who's not and the fact that they, they can't even distinguish between the licenses is a very big concern to us. All right, we're going to go on to our uh, final round of questions, COVID and vaccines. Uh, first question, uh, 60 seconds uh, to you, Leah. Massachusetts is leading the way in vaccination rates nationwide. The Commonwealth is one of nine states throughout the country with over 80% of the population being fully vaccinated. Leah, you've talked publicly about uh, being let go from your job as a nurse uh, for refusing to get vaccinated. As Lieutenant Governor, can you legitimately help lead the state's response to the virus when you're not heeding the advice of state, national, and international health experts? Yes, so uh, 
The CDC just removed the distinction between vaccinated and unvaccinated, and the fact is that lives were ruined over bad data. So now that the CDC has finally come around and looked at the data that some of us had been talking about for over a year, uh, now they're making decisions. Uh, when in, Actually, this is what I'm talking about when we need critical thinking in leadership. The data was always there. It's just that no one in a leadership position was willing to look at it, and the experts don't agree. There are plenty of scientists, plenty of doctors who are saying something else that when against the official CDC narrative. And it, now that um, some time has passed, we're starting to realize that, you know, the, that what I was talking about, it was actually right that the vaccines were not working, that the mandates didn't help uh, mitigate the virus. And I think that as Lieutenant Governor, that's something that I bring as a, as a strength to that office to be able to look at those issues and make those decisions. Was the Baker administration wrong in promoting vaccines as they did? So I just want to be clear on our policy. We are not anti-vaccine. I think anyone who wants to get a vaccine is free to do so, and I encourage them to. We are anti-mandate because the government should not be involved in your health care decisions. And any time that the government tries to, to uh, make you choose between your job or making a personal medical decision, to me that's a red flag for government overreach and it shouldn't be tolerated. Okay, uh, Kate, uh, 60 seconds. Uh, last summer, Governor Baker ordered all executive branch employees to be required to prove their vaccination status. Of the roughly 41,000 workers in that branch, roughly 1,000 left their jobs because of the requirement. Uh, both GOP gubernatorial candidates, Chris Doty and Jeff Deal, have said they plan to rehire employees who were let go from their jobs for refusing to get vaccinated. Uh, Kate, your husband, Representative Peter Durant, was vocally opposed to the state State House's vaccine mandate, uh, state health leaders have been very clear vaccination is the best way to protect yourself from COVID-19. As Lugen Lieutenant Governor, do you think it would be part of your job to follow the rules set by the state? Well, I think we could all look back with hindsight on what we could have done differently during the pandemic, but I think the best measure is to see what someone actually did. And I look at what Chris Doty did with his business. This was real life for him, his employees, and his business. What Chris did was educate his employees about the vaccine, about COVID, but he let them make the best health decision that was right for them to keep them healthy. And that's exactly what Chris Doty and I would do as governor and lieutenant governor, provide leadership, but allow people to make their own health decisions. And I do think it's important to point out the vaccines have prevented, the data has shown, it has borne out, have prevented severe illness and death. We do need to say that. Uh, on, on trust, looking back uh, on the last two years of this pandemic, what did the Baker administration do well that you would like to uh, remember and carry on if elected? Leah? Uh, in the beginning, I think that the 15 days to flatten the curve was something that we could all get on board with. That was when it was very unknown. We didn't know what we were dealing with, um, and everybody was willing to work together and make sure that we got a handle on things. But as the data continued to come out, I think that there was uh, kind of a slow reaction time in implementing uh, new policies or rescinding some of the more um, heavy-handed policies. I mean. Over 40% of our small businesses in Massachusetts closed during the pandemic, and it's been really difficult for them to get back up and running now with the cost of, of goods and, and um, our, the uh, uh, pro problem getting materials and things like that. So um, I think that we just need to really look at some of these consequences of what happened and go forward and not make those same mistakes. Kate, 15 seconds. Uh, sure. I, I, I think that Governor Baker did well with the information that he had. This was brand new to all of us, this pandemic. And I think what happened was, uh, from all perspectives of government, what happened was taking that um, precaution to control. And I think there's a lot, again, we can look back with hindsight in 2020, but we need to move past that. We need to look forward. All right, we've talked about the job and specific policies, but before we let you go, let's do a couple of lightning round questions again to help folks get a sense of who you each are. Uh, first question, I'm um, go to Leah. Uh, favorite Massachusetts beach? Nahant Beach. Um, it's great for little kids. It's a, kind of a cove where the, it's not the open ocean, uh, so it's, it's nice and calm. The, the uh, sand is beautiful and soft, and there's a great restaurant called the Tides Restaurant right nearby, and um, I've grew up going there. I take my kids there now. I, I just love it there. Okay. 
I, I'd probably say Salisbury Beach. Um, being a, a child, we, my parents took me up there, there quite a bit. Um, haven't been there in a few years, but uh, always, always love Salisbury Beach. Okay, and Kate, I'm gonna come back to you and sure. ask best place to go on vacation. Uh, in Massachusetts? Yeah. Um, oh gosh, well that's a part of, of being uh, in charge of tourism. There's so much that Massachusetts <laughs> has to offer. It's so hard to narrow that down right now. But um, on a summer day like this, it's hard to say, um, not say Cape Cod, but on a fall day, the Berkshires and Central Mass are, are just great for the, the foliage and driving around. Leah? Yeah, difficult to decide. Definitely, uh, we have great beaches. We have Salisbury Beach. We have Wingercheek Beach up in Gloucester. We have Cape Cod. I've also um, heard that out in the Berkshires is a, is a beautiful place in the summertime. Um, I don't get out there much um, until I started campaigning, spending more time in Western Mass now, and it's really beautiful. The people are great, and I think definitely that's something that we can highlight. People tend to go to Maine and New Hampshire for... Lightning uh, round. Okay. Like, lightning <laughs> round. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, right but, uh, okay, we'll come back to you, uh, Leah, and ask, uh, what do you like to do when you're not working? Um, I spend as much time as I can with my kids and my husband. Uh, we are novice beekeepers. We opened uh, our first beehive um, this spring, so that's been an interesting endeavor and just spending time with my family and friends. Kate? I, I love spending time with my husband and my family. Um, that's what I look forward to anytime I have free time. Got it. And uh, this one is real controversial. Prepare yourselves. Uh, coffee, hot or iced? Definitely hot. <laughs> hot for business, iced for pleasure. Um, <laughs> hot in the morning, definitely, um, but iced, you know, in the midday pickup. Got it. And first concert you've ever attended, Kate? I think it might have been a Spice Girls concert. <laughs> uh, mine was in a TRL concert back when TRL was on MTV. All right. And uh, we're going to head to closing statements right now. And um, as with our opening statements, the order was determined by random draw. Uh, Kate Campanelli, we'll start with you. Uh, you have one minute. Sure. I want to thank everyone for being here today, especially to the listeners who will ultimately decide the direction of the Commonwealth. In this primary, we only have one chance to get it right. For 22 of the last 30 years, Massachusetts has elected a pragmatic Republican team to the corner office. Opting for the checks and balances that come with a two-party state has largely meant a prosperous Commonwealth. But our work is far from complete. There's too much at stake come, to come in second this November. So if you remember just one thing from this debate, we can choose a team that everyone knows will lose to Maura Healy and return our state to a single party control. We know that will happen because we've seen this movie before with Jeff Deal. Or we can choose a team that has the experience, the resources, and the momentum to defeat Maura Healy and to keep a two party state is so vital to our success. Chris Stodi and I, Kate Campanelli, are asking for your votes because we believe in Massachusetts and we believe that the best days are ahead of us. Thank you. Leah? Thank you uh, for hosting this debate. Thanks, Kate, for coming. I just wanted to respond very quickly to the fact that I left the legislature. Yes, I left the legislature. I returned to the private sector. Uh, you want to constantly bash Jeff Deal for being a career politician, and then you also want to bash me for not being a career politician, where you you started as a staffer at the State House, you ran, uh, you are a state representative, you left the legislature to run for Register of Deeds, you lost that race, and then you returned to run for Lieutenant Governor after having a state job in between. So I think that voters need to realize that I'm in this because I care about the issues. Jeff Deal cares about the issues. We're standing up for the people of Massachusetts. We're here to protect your wallet, protect your freedoms, protect your children in school and make sure that parents have a voice. They're, they're going to be a huge demographic in this race and they're coming to us because they're tired of the division of the Democratic Party and they want normalcy and law and order and that's what Jeff Deal and I will bring to office. So I'm asking for your vote on September 6th in the primary. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the time we have for today. Stay with WBUR, WCVB and the Boston Globe for coverage of the primary elections coming up on September 6th. I'd also like to thank the several former lieutenant governors, Frank Bellotti, Tom O'Neill, Evelyn Murphy, Jane Swift, and Tim Murray, for their contributions in helping craft some of the questions today. And thank you also to our guests today, the two Republican candidates for lieutenant governor, Kate Campanelli and Leah Cole Allen. 
A special thanks to WCVB for co-sponsoring today's debate and to Sharman Sacchetti for co-hosting today and to the Radio Boston and engineering teams at WBUR for producing today's debate. All right. Thanks, Daryl and Steve. We also want to thank our other co-sponsor, the Boston Globe, and thank you to our audience on air at WBUR online and live here at WBUR City Space. You can listen back to the full debate on our websites, WBUR.org, BostonGlobe.com, and WCVB.com. And don't forget to vote on September 6th. And join us tomorrow, same time, 11 o'clock, to hear the three candidates running for the Democratic nomination for Lieutenant Governor. That'll be here on Radio Boston at City Space, live here uh, in, in the, uh, the arena. So uh, we hope you'll join us then. You might want to listen in and see what the, the other guys are saying. I'm Steve Brown. Join us again tomorrow for more Radio Boston. This is 90.9 WBUR Boston, 89.1 WBUH Brewster, and 92.7 WBUA Tisbury.